Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, qualitative uh, research professionals. Um, I got a couple of requests um, to talk about um, ethics and the business of ethics and how it matters in doing your research, uh, if you're doing qualitative research. This also falls under quantitative research as well, and it's kind of a universal sort of um, thing we're looking at uh, to make sure that um, all the research is done uh, within um, certain rules um, that are covered by um, IRB, the Institutional Review Board. And what that means is that each institution that sponsors a, a research project uh, would have an Institutional Review Board. And that board uh, looks at how you're collecting data, what questions you're asking, um, you know, uh, what is the circumstances and are you causing any harm? I'm going to go back to the causing harm thing because I think that's central to what we talk about um, when we're talking about ethics. Let me, let me just bring up my, um, my screen here. Uh, uh, let's see what I have here. And this I posted on Canvas. Uh, I don't know what that is. Uh, I posted this on Canvas so you guys can take a look at. Um, I actually used a, uh, this in another uh, a lot of these, a lot of this deck, not the whole deck, but a lot of it I used in a counseling research program, which is a, a, a um, class, which is a, an advanced um, graduate studies uh, research program. But it really runs the same thing. And it's not really difficult, um, but there are some, you're going to hear a lot of these things as you develop your research um, knowledge uh, and how you handle uh, things going forward. So let's just dive into it real quick. Let me get my screen um, slideshow going here. Uh, okay. All right. So um, again, uh, I use some tenants uh, from this counseling research uh, textbook uh, that I have. I think it's excellent and I think it's a good way to um, uh, to, to get a good foundational understanding of what research entails. And I'm not only going to talk about uh, the research paper, but just, you know, sort of the history of what research is all about. And I did hear you. Uh, there are some uh, students who are asking questions if I can do some more of this. Uh, I'm going to do my best to do some of this. I'm not very photogenic, um, so part, pardon me. Uh, and uh, so let's go, let's just go forward here. So the learning objectives is to understand and define research ethics and research integrity. Um, we want to apply these principles in responsible research, uh, in responsible research to conduct behavioral science in the, in the behavioral science field. Um, and we also want to describe problems in the past. We're going to go over some history uh, so you can actually see where these research tenants come from. So when you have to go in front of an institutional review board. Uh, you'll use some of those words like uh, beneficence and, and other other words that you're going to learn here and throughout your um, research learning days. You're going to learn some of these uh, ethical um, principles and what is uh, what is occurring. I did post a video of Stan the Milgram experiment. It's a classic experiment. There's a couple of others. I was going to post one. Um, uh, with this uh, instructor, teacher who was giving, um, uh, uh, doing a little study right after Martin Luther King died. Uh, I was going to do that, but I said, you know, let me do the Milgram experiment um, because that's a little more shocking, if you will, uh, to the uh, student. Um, uh, what they did, what, Mil what Stanley Milgram was doing was uh, he was trying to see why does, why did, um, you know, uh, people in at the, gr at the ground level of the uh, Nazi uh, time in 1930s and 40s, why did they follow orders? You know, what compelled them to say, you know what, even though I know I'm hurting someone, I still have to follow orders. And what disassociations they made um, to, to push that button, to, to, to do what they had to do. Uh, and, and the excuses they use. So uh, it was a really interesting experiment. It does tell us a lot about human behavior. And, um, and it tells us that uh, we have to be responsible citizens. And we have to make sure that we don't pass an ethical line uh, so that when we do our research, it's complete. It's done in a human, humane kind of way. And no one was hurt from the research and no one will be hurt from the research because the overall thing is you just don't want to um, do things uh, that may end up hurting uh, people or a group of people or a, a type of persons like the Tuskegee experiment uh, that, that targeted uh, black uh, African-Americans 
uh, by inserting uh, syphilis into their uh, bodies and seeing how they react to it. I wouldn't get into all that in a minute. Um, let's see. Okay, we're going to explain various ethical considerations in conducting a research study. Uh, from development of a research idea through the publication and identify the three central components of the Belmont Report. And you're going to hear that word a lot in your in your research days. I'm sorry about that. That's my phone ringing. Uh, you're going to hear a lot about that in your research uh, studies, uh, the Belmont Report, and how each uh, of the, those com uh, components uh, work. Uh, here I wrote down in the field of counseling, but this applies to um, any uh, behavioral science field as well. And part of me, if you, I, I'm confusing you, you know, I, I this, this, uh, like I said, this deck I used originally a couple of years ago. I thought it was a good one. Uh, students really liked it. Uh, it was clear for them, so I want to use it again uh, in this class. So, so counseling, uh, behavior research, behavioral uh, studies, it's, uh, they're, they're kind of both under the same umbrella anyway. Um, so, uh, research ethics, integrity, uh, and responsible responsible conduct of research. Uh, ethical codes related to um, and including, again, this is the ACA guidelines. We don't have to worry about that. Uh, making ethical decisions. Um, research ethics uh, do not uh, provide specific answers to ethical dilemmas, but guiding judgment and decision-making processes. So now, what that's saying is um, uh, the, res the, the ethics that you are bound to might not have specific um, uh, uh, or, or scenario-based things or anything that, that you can feed off of, but it wants to give you a basic um, foundational understanding of what's expected of you and what decisions you make. So research ethics is defined as a study or science of right and wrong, and that's pretty much what that is, uh, what, what you define as right and wrong. The problem is we're human beings, and um, some of us feel that things are right. And if you look at our politics today, and I don't want to get too into politics because that's all I, what I've been doing is watching politics for the last four years. Um, certain people believe uh, something is right, and other people believe something is wrong, and there's a lot of uh, you know gray areas in the middle. Uh, so what research ethics tries to do is try to clear that gray area up and make sure that we ha uh, we're all on the same page when it comes to uh, research ethics. Um, but it is a study of right and wrong. Uh, you know, I, we could sit here and talk philosophically of what is right and what is wrong. Um, uh, I I always lean my hat on, you know, if somebody's going to be hurt from something, you could, it's probably going to be wrong. Uh, if somebody's going to be embarrassed by something, it's probably going to be wrong. Uh, you want to make sure that the research is clear, concise, and um, on, uh, to the point. Uh, but also that it's um, discovered, done uh, through the entire process where no one's hurt and no one's embarrassed and no one's, uh, you know, we're not doing something that may uh, be uh, unfavorable to some uh, someone. Um, there's also research integrity, which is defined as uh, a commitment to in intellectual honesty and personal responsibility. Uh, so the, the research integrity really asks us to make sure that we look at ourselves and see exactly what we're doing and say, you know what, um, you know, we are taking a personal responsibility to what's happening. Uh, this is my work. Uh, I stand by it. Uh, and I want to make sure that it's done correctly um, so that because you're going to get hit with questions and a good research paper, bad research paper, you're going to get questions from all sides. And one thing you don't want to have compromised is your research integrity. You want to make sure that the the data is the data is correct. You want to make sure that um, you did it in the right way, uh, and you want to divulge all that work um, and, and and put that in, into your paper. Let's see. Responsible conduct of research is defined as conducting research in a manner that fulfills professional responsibilities of the researcher. Um, again, uh, making sure, again, checking yourself, uh, making sure that you're doing something that's um, appropriate for your profession. Um, there are a lot of different ethics codes out there. A lot of associations put them together, whether you're in counseling, you may have an association of counseling, American, American Association of Counseling. They'll have a uh, um, an ethics sort of code that you can go by as a guideline. 
Uh, if you're in the medical field, you may have something that came out of the Amer American Medical Association. They'll have their ethics code. Uh, let's see, uh, if you are in school and in higher education or other um, areas, police, whatever it is, they may have they they may have a an association attached to them, and they would have ethics codes uh, built into uh, what they're doing. So use that as a guideline and making sure that uh, you'd be responsible. Uh, but ultimately, at the end of the day, um, you need to feel good about yourself. You need to feel that you did something on your own. So yes, these guidelines are important, but more more importantly. Um, the, the, the way uh, you can check yourself is to make sure you ask yourself, did I do the right thing? Did I uh, do something that's going to hurt someone? Uh, can I fix this? Um, how can I get out of doing uh, this, uh, this inquiry? Because by doing something, is by doing um, a certain type of treatment, for instance, it may hurt someone or, or may hurt them for the long term or may hurt them in the future. Uh, so you got to make sure that you are checking yourself when you're doing research. research. Um, when you're doing a research paper, uh, you know, I got this little graph here. It talks about, uh, you know, you're the researcher on, uh, you know, in a car there. And um, uh, that's the road ahead of you when it comes to uh, doing your uh, uh, road to responsibility. Uh, you know, impartiality, humane treatment, are you using animal subjects, are they being treated fairly, are they eating correctly, you know, it, uh, if you do with children, did you get um, uh, consent forms to, to do something? Um, you know, uh, because you, you certainly don't want to stand out there as a researcher doing work and did not get all the consent you needed, because uh, you will find yourself in litigation if that is if that becomes a problem. Uh, not only you, but the institution you represent. Um, so. Uh, this is sort of um, boilerplate stuff uh, from counseling and behavioral sciences areas. Uh, I, I've, I've, I've used this in, when I was teaching uh, some ethics courses in uh, police management uh, and other areas where they're doing uh, standard research. Uh, I also give this uh, deck to uh, uh, doctoral students who are having uh, trouble understanding what it is that they can do and what they can't do as far as research goes. It's all pretty much the same thing, and I'm going to just uh, quickly go through this. Um, so the core areas of responsibility is um, uh, data acquisition, making sure that um, we're finding the right way to get data. Um, if there's mentor and training relationships, um, you may have a mentor. Um, how does that relationship work? You know, are, you know, are there unethical practices? Is one person wanting to have their name in front of in the, in the front of the paper as opposed to the other? And you need to tease that out. Um, that may become problematic. Um, publication practices and responsible authorship, making sure that you are, if you're going to cite something or quote someone or or do a treatment that's been done before, making sure you give them the credit that they have, uh, make sure that you get the permission to use the instrument. Uh, and so there's a few different things there. There's also a peer review. What that, that means is that um, your paper or your work has been uh, looked at by peers and they said, yes, this is an excellent paper. Or they say, no, we have problems with this paper and they give you an um, explanation, explanation why. Uh, peer review, when you're doing your research in um, qual uh, qualitative research, I like to look at peer review papers because I know that there someone looked at it already and someone has blessed it, if you will. Uh, peer review, it does. it's not the, the end all. Uh, there are some papers that haven't been peer reviewed, but they, they don't hold up as well as those peer reviewed papers. Uh, collaborative sciences, there may be some sciences that go over each other. Uh, so you may have a counseling uh, um, matter uh, that may bleed into some other matter, maybe psychology or some other type of, of discipline. Uh, you may have to do that. You have to worry about human subjects as well. And that's what ethics is really uh, wor worried about is understanding that if you're going to put someone into a study uh, and observe them, uh, make sure that you're doing it correctly. Make sure that they know what's happening uh, and they can um, be assured that their privacy is being protected. 
Um, they can be assured that they're not giving any kind of treatment that's going to harm them. Uh, it doesn't have to be a, a, a you know a, a pill or a placebo or anything. It could be the heat in the room. Uh, you, you may be interested in looking at um, students and their attention um, in a room that has no air, no air conditioning and one that has uh, good air conditioning. Uh, you want to make sure you don't uh, do things that are um, out of sorts, uh, that's going to hurt someone. Um, uh, and then you got uh, some, some uh, research involves animals. That's really not for this course, but in, in reality, there are, there are a lot of research projects that do uh, involve animals, whether it's, uh, you know, mice or, uh, you know, monkeys or something to try to um, uh, see behaviors, um, putting some variables and some conditions on them and see what their reactions are. Um, those things are under scrutiny as well, um, actually very tight scrutiny in the universities to make sure that they're not doing anything um, inappropriate that's going to hurt uh, an animal in any way. Um, so uh, that's that. Uh, research misconduct. Uh, there are some times people do have some research misconduct out there, violation of ethical principles. Uh, there could be, a, you know, um, uh, failure to reveal some things uh, that uh, some data that they or, or misrepresenting data uh, that could be really troubling, especially, you know, you know, say uh, you're doing something uh, to mitigate COVID or, or something and you come up with something, but you haven't put all the data in. Um, or you just put the unfavorable data out, that's research misconduct, and that could be real troublesome. Uh, there's also this notion of conflicts of interest and commitment. Conflicts of interest, um, who's paying for this research? Uh, you, know, um, you, know, you know, are you, are you doing a research um, uh, project uh, and, and uh, the, the uh, sponsors to the research, research project wants you to do something favorable for their product or for their interest. Uh, so we want to make sure that we reveal all the conflicts of interest that, that may occur. Uh, there are some, uh, but at the end of a good research paper, they will tell you that. These are the, they'll actually have a, a statement of conflicts of interest. So yes, uh, this paper was um, uh, sponsored by the University of Ohio, and they had some uh, endowments from uh, DuPont, and DuPont is looking good here, or whatever it is. Uh, so we want to make sure that transparency is is out there, uh, that we're doing that. Uh, I put this slide up here. I, don't, I should have just left it off, but it's, it's okay. Um, this uh, slide is how you, how you collect your data, how you share your data. This is mostly, um, I, I want to talk a second, talk, talk about SPSS is really a qu quantitative methods um, uh, world. SPSS is a an, uh, computer program that gathers data and manipulates it and spits it out into really good reports. And, and, and you know, it's, it's, a, it's a valuable tool uh, for a, uh, a quantitative researcher. We're in qualitative mode here. So um, we'll talk about this one here. Uh, this one's another one. It's called Max QDI, QDA. Um, that's more of a qualitative program. And again, it, look, it looks for words, um, like words, and tries to put them to themes. And you can actually start gathering data and, and getting some answers using these thematic um, uh, uh, responses from uh, MaxQDA. I don't want you to worry too, too much about any of this stuff. Uh, you can also get some um, data from uh, polls, uh, again, you know, the census. Or there may be some elect, uh, electronic files out there that you can look at. You can look at some archival things. Uh, but for the most part, when you're doing qualitative analysis, um, we are actually exploring the you know behaviors. We're, we're exploring people. We're looking at things outside of the numbers world uh, that the numbers might not be able to catch. But this is a, a, a this is an interesting slide. It kind of tells you what's going on when we do the um, quantitative world um, uh, class. We'll talk more about SPSS. Um, again, we talked about this, uh, the mentor training relationship, making sure that the research results are there. Um, publication practices, who's going to do it, um, making sure that all this stuff, all, you know, um, all the uh, authorship is done correctly. 
and peer review we talked about that uh, and there, there may be some authorship disputes um, if you go into grad school or a, um, a higher level of uh, research um, you know there may be some collaborative sciences like I said uh, in this cartoon here uh, one one group may have one set of answers another has another set but there are some issues on authorship who who, who owns the data Again, human subjects, um, we talked about uh, informed consent, making sure there's confidentiality. Uh, we're, uh, we're worried about privacy issues. And again, this is more the qualitative side, the human subjects um, uh, issues, uh, IRB review, adherence to study protocol, and making sure you um, the target populations are considered. Um, are you targeting minorities? Uh, uh, make sure you clearly identify why you're doing that and why you are not doing a general study. Are you targeting children and are you targeting elderly? These are special populations that you have to take extra consideration uh, when you are when you are um, collecting data or doing a, uh, uh, interviews or something. Again, I talked about uh, animals. I'm going to go through that again, treatment animals. Um, Again, research misconduct could lead to falsification, fabricating information, plagiarism. Uh, that's a big deal. Someone may come. There was actually a uh, professor who actually um, someone who wrote something that uh, a while back ago, and they were out of Harvard University, you know, wonderful school. They wrote some uh, interesting work, and after it was looked at over and over again, they found that there was a lot of plagiarism in that paper. And it caused this one person his job as a um, researcher uh, at Harvard University. But you know, before that, he was hailed as a brilliant uh, person. Um, but a lot of the work was um, plagiarized, and there were some errors on that. Can't think of it now. Who was um, conflicts of interest again? Who paid for the study? Who was benefits from a positive study outcome? Uh, is there a line uh, with um, university and endowments? Um, you see that a lot. A lot of times, universities will um, sponsor, will will um, get money from a corporation uh, to do a study, and if the study is favorable, they'll publish it. If it's not favorable, they won't publish it because they don't want the stock prices going down or whatever. So you got to make sure you keep all those conflicts of interest uh, clear. I want to get to um, the. And you guys can look at this. Uh, some of the um, some of the evolution of research ethics, I think it's important. Uh, there are four studies that come to my mind uh, that in the 20th century that led to the development of today's ethical standards to protect human rights. Uh, one of them was the Nazi medical war crimes. If I have this on, yeah, okay. Um, the other was Tuskegee syphilis study, the Jewish chronic disease hospital study and the Willow Book Study. We'll go over each one of them so you can get a better idea. Uh, the Nazi medical war crimes in World War II, the Nazi physicians conducted experiments on prisoners in concentration camps to investigate how the human body would react to various extremes. You know, they put them in cold weather situations uh, because they were looking to fight wars in Russia and they wanted to advance, you know, Operation Barbarossa or whatever it was, uh, Germany going into Russia. Uh, so they want to see what the extreme temperatures were. So you're putting them, putting um, uh, prisoners uh, in concentration camp into these extreme weather conditions and, and other, other things they were looking at. Um, a lot of these experiments um, resulted in disease, anguish, suffering, and death. Uh, some real tough stuff there. Um, and um, what uh, they come to find that uh, they didn't care about the human subject. Um, they wanted to see the results of the experiment. How, what's the tolerance levels of certain things that are that are given to them? Um, and there was no check and balance on them to say, hey, you can't do that. Uh, so that was non-existent at the time. Uh, then you had the Tuskegee syphilis study. We're hearing a lot about that now because of the COVID um, uh, virus uh, vaccination programs. Uh, a lot of uh, African Americans are a little leery on viruses or anything, you know, to, or, or vaccinations or anything to do with government uh, telling you take a take a pill, take a, 
uh, a shot, whatever it is. Uh, so they're they're less likely to do this because of the historical um, matters of this. And one of them is the Tuskegee syphilis study, where um, uh, there was an experiment that included 600 black males. The goal was to examine the impact of syphilis on humans. And what was happening was they were told that they were receiving free treatment, they were free her free uh, health care, this and that. And, uh, and, uh, but they weren't told that they were um, not being treated. Uh, and so they wanted to, uh, and on the side, behind the, the scenes, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the scientists were looking at uh, how degrading uh, the, uh, the disease made the person. Uh, physical issues, mental issues, um, all kinds of social issues. They were trying to see what syphilis was actually doing to the people in the long term. Meanwhile, they're telling those people, hey, look, and they, they did have a cure for it. They had penicillin was developed uh, and they weren't giving them the cure uh, on purpose. Um, so uh, it was a tough deal. And uh, it came out in the 70s and 80s. Um, a lot of this stuff came out and uh, not only was it a horrible thing, but the government had to apologize uh, to the African-American community. Uh, that they were pretty much uh, lab rats uh, for a long term, like 40 years. Um, this can't happen. Um, then you had the Jewish chronic disease hospital study. The study was conducted to examine if a human body could reject cancer cells. And I, this study happened, I think it was in Long Island, um, where, um, where uh, there was, they wanted to see if, uh, the, you know, it, it, they were going to be injected um, with um, live cancer cells, and, and they were, and, and the subjects were not told that they were, they were again, they were, they were not given any documentation about the study and the potential, uh, and the potential harm to the subjects. Uh, so they were being given cancer and not being told, uh, and they wanted to see how it, you know, if things can help reject it, uh, if their body types can help reject it. Uh, so it was a tough one. And the Willowbrook study was a, another one um, where um, uh, it was a school uh, that they wanted to see the effects hepatitis virus had on children in a controlled environment. And to be admitted into school, the parents would have to consent to have the child injected with hepatitis virus. Um, it sounds terrible now, but these things actually really happen. Uh, this study raised questions as to the adequacy of informed consent and the freedom of human participants. So in other words, you want to take your kid to a school, um, whether it's a private school or whatever, and, you, you know, you, you do whatever you have to do, but then they're going to tell you, oh, by the way, you're going to have to, uh, your child's going to have to take this um, uh, this uh, hepatitis virus. Uh, they all have hepatitis, so he's going to get it anyway uh, because he's going to be with these kids. So they injected him with the, the hepatitis virus. And um, disclosure was a big issue with this, this one case. Uh, they're not disclosing the full uh, issues with this. Uh, so after a lot of these um, uh, things happened, the Belmont report came out. I believe it was a, 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 a conference in, um, in uh, I think, um, in Colorado or something. And, uh, and, and the report came out talking about the results of the Tuskegee syphilis study. Um, and this Belmont report came out of that conference as the document, uh, uh, you know, the foundational document for ethical principles to protect um, participants. Um, so there's three tenets to the Belmont, three, three principles to the uh, Belmont report that you as a researcher need to understand. And this is, I mean, if you don't, if you don't listen to anything else I said, you guys got to remember this stuff here. Um, uh, when you're doing your research, or conducting research, or being part of a research program, um, you have to make sure uh, that these sort of principles are followed. Uh, number one is respect for the persons. Um, this actually includes two uh, standards. Uh, the first standard is uh, that you're treating uh, them as autonomous agents. Uh, human participant uh, opinions, thoughts, and choices should be heard and respected. Um, and you must provide full disclosure uh, regarding the subject with no consequences uh, for not participating. 
Um, I, know, I remember a couple of years ago, University of Penn was doing a study on smoking, um, uh, and they were uh, they actually had to give out uh, they had to follow these principles to make sure that uh, the subjects understood what they had to do. So they actually paid students to smoke cigarettes and then find out, you know, at, at certain rates and find out what the impact was on their lungs. And it's all, it's all legitimate, all you know, up to date. But I remember one of my students was in this, uh, in this thing and he only did it because they were giving him money. I think he gave him $40 or something. Um, and, um, and he showed me this form, and it was a form of uh, showing them what the responsibilities were of the researchers. And they cited the Belmont report as being a cornerstone um, document to make sure that they're um, working in ethical standards. Um, Beneficence is, uh, it really means, and all it means is do good, just, just do good. Uh, you know, produce good. That's what the dictionary says. But the act of just doing good, making sure that you're not trying to hurt someone. Uh, so um, you want to make sure that the researcher um, uh, says, you know, we're going to do this research and the research is important. And, it, you know, we don't want to harm anyone. Sure. Uh, but the overall one is we want to make sure uh, uh, that the study um, doesn't put anyone at risk. Um, this is an important uh, criterion um, to make sure that your research is on the up and up and making sure that it's not just doing research for the hell of it. Uh, you're doing something to advance a body of knowledge somehow. And then finally, there's justice. Uh, justice deals with the fairness related to the question. Uh, who's burning the risk? Um, uh, you know, uh, is it done safely? Um, uh, uh, you know, are there interference with life? Um, is, a, um, is it ensuring that the, um, that the uh, participants are getting what they need as a result of the, pro of the, um, of the, of the uh, study, uh, whether specific treatments, them telling about the outcome, making sure that there be, you know, the confidentiality is, is followed. So making sure that we're staying um, in line with, um, with the law in line with uh, justice. And that's pretty much um, the entire uh, slide deck here. Um, one thing about the institutional review boards is to, uh, you know, um, uh, each school, Rosemont has one, everyone has one that, that does research. Um, uh, so when you do a proposal for a particular research, you are proposing to do something. You want to do a, a research project. You're going to have to bring your proposal, paper, document uh, to the Institutional Review Board. They look at it. They, look, they are looking at the methodology. They're looking at how you're going to get these people. They're looking at your treatment. They're looking at uh, what else are they looking at? Um, they're looking at any instrumentation you're using, um, uh, any kinds of... Um, uh, 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 the, the methodology, I think I said that, but uh, uh, they want to see that you're not doing anything that's going to violate institutions uh, or, or um, uh, ethical codes. And they may come back and say, you know what, this is a really good um, study. It's, it's uh, you know, it's admirable. It's got this. However, um, you're um, putting someone at risk. Uh, can you change this? Can you change that? And you, the researcher, are going to have to take a look at it and either make the change or you cannot go forward. Um, and this, this is Student Review Board. It really helps keep things in, 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 uh, in, in the right lanes. And it also protects the, the institutions um, from litigation if there is a problem. I think that's it. All right. And the rest, we don't have to do. Uh, you guys can read the rest of this stuff about confidentiality. Um, and again, I, I use this deck. I use it originally for my counseling researchers, um, but I think it, it blends well with the behavioral sciences and um, uh, the qualitative um, researchers that you guys uh, are doing right now. It's not very, it's not a very difficult concept, um, but uh, you should be aware of it. Um, it's going to come up again uh, in your graduate studies. Uh, where um, ethical behavior um, it may um, 
stop you from doing a research project or may uh, endorse a research project. Uh, you have to look at the ethical principles behind it. Okay, uh, with that, I will stop and see how this turned out. Okay, have a great day.